Tiny AI, I kind of laughed when they said tiny AI. I was like, what the heck is that? It sounds so small and tiny and even kind of cute, <laughs> but it's quite the contrary. <clears throat> I'd like it to welcome to our stage Mika from IMEC to talk all about this tiny powerhouse. Good afternoon, everybody. What a great place to be here to be talking to you about tiny AI. Now, AI and health have always had a very good match over the last years, even when you walk around here at SAS. What you see, you see a lot of new innovative solutions for uh, you know, predictive medicine, for personalized care, etc. But what all these solutions have in common is they always have need for big data, data sets, a big environment in the cloud, and big algorithms. And that comes at a certain cost, and that's going to be my presentation uh, about tiny AI, is how can we solve this? How can we create a future for AI where this cost is, is tackled in a positive way? Now, when you think about it, um, at the moment, you see a lot and a lot of solutions being created for the patients or for the doctors. There's actually one group being left out in the healthcare, which are actually the caretakers like the nurses. In a recent report from Accenture, what you see up here, it's been told that uh, you know, solutions and assistance to help nurses in their work is going to be one of the top cases that we will see over the next 10 years. And why is this? Because if you read the report and any other report, you actually see that 40 to 45% of nursing time is spent in the wrong way because they, don't, or they are unable to help the right patients at the right moment in time which leaves them to a lot of stress and unhappiness that the job that they have chosen, namely to help patients out there, isn't fulfilled in the correct way. Very often, and you can read it in the report, they're coming up too late when a patient has fallen down because they were too busy looking at other patients in time, which weren't maybe even, you know, needing help at that point in time. So you can say, but where's technology in this story? Why are we unable to help patients at the right time? So should we at more cameras in the place. You could say, well, cameras, I mean, cameras are very in invasive. They're pri privacy preserving. Additionally, cameras in an area just like a bathroom in a hospital might not be the right solution. And additionally, everybody knows that looking at cameras and um, analyzing uh, image is a very time consuming activity. So that's not the right solution. So should we then add more, uh, more solutions or more cables and not more assistance to our beds? No, that's not the right solution either. If you talk to nurses and you read the report, they say well, it's already complex enough to look at all those new instruments that are attached to those beds. When you then go up to the control room where they receive all that data from all the solutions out there in order to prioritize to which patients they have to go, they, they, they tell us, no, we already overloaded with too much information. Based on the information we receive, we are unable to quali qualify and optimize our time right now. So what's then the right solution? What can we do? Now, that's where tiny AI comes in place. And in order to understand tiny AI, we first have to think about how current AI solutions work. They will collect data, and you will recognize this, right on the edge, on the extreme edge, on the wearables, on the devices that are out there, they will collect that data and send it over to the cloud. In the cloud, there we have the big algorithms running that are going to crunch that data. They're going to come up with an insight, with an intelligence that we didn't know, in order to make the right act action. You can say, well, that's, that's how we know AI right now, and that's correct. However, this comes at a certain cost. I don't know how many people realize that, but AI at the moment has 2% you know, of the CO2 emission, uh, the consumption is caused by AI solutions out there. So not only is it not privacy preserving, it's a very energy, non-efficient way of working. So where is tiny AI coming in place? Well, we can say, first of all, this is something you recognize, we're gonna add more sensors, we're gonna add more devices into our rooms, which are not connected, which are battery powered, etc. and that's gonna solve it. But that's not correct. To be very honest, in the same uh, analysis, you can see that if we are going to continue to add up IoT devices to our different environments, being it health or being in other environments, in 2030, 20% of the CO2 emissions are going to be caused by sending data from the backwards and forwards between those devices, but also between the cloud and back to the device uh, in order to get the intelligence that we are looking for. That's not working. It's time to talk about tiny AI right now. 
This is going to solve the problem. Now, Tiny AI is all about turning that whole concept around. So we'll keep our IoT devices, but instead of just collecting data right on the edge and on the extreme edge, we're also going to process that data, and we're going to make the decisions on that data right on that edge, right on that extreme edge. That means that those algorithms are going to run on those tiny devices that are going to run on the chips, that are going to run on, on, the, on the variables that we have, et cetera. So there's no more backwards and forwards of sending data out there. Now, that seems simple, but it is actually quite complex, because that means that we have to look at new, new ways of doing it, of running AI, because suddenly you're having to run your AI on much smaller scale um, um, hardware. So your hardware has to be much more power efficient. Secondly, you can't have access to, to, to that much amount of data anymore. So we have to find smarter ways to work with much less data, but with uh, the same potential of same accuracy in making predictions that we currently have. And last but not least, we have to find new algorithms that are much more going to look like the algorithms we're using in our brain. For example, when we learn a new activity, we are able to reuse some things we've learned before in order to apply that to another activity. Take, for example, playing tennis. If you already play squash, it's e easier to play tennis. We don't have to restart from scratch. Well, this is what our algorithm should be able to do. At the moment, everybody out there creating a new solution is training that solution from scratch instead of using pre-trained material from other algorithms out there already. So these are things that we have to do, not in a silo, but all together in order to make it work. Now, you can say, but that's a great concept, but you know, do you have any real case? And indeed, we have cases out there. You can come and see us at our iMac stand, iMac boot. And one of those cases is a new radar chip. You see from the size of the chip that it's pretty tiny. It actually has an on-chip antenna. It has an ability to run the algorithms for detection on the chip by itself. There is no need to send data backwards and forwards out of the chip in order to make a decision and to get an insight. Now you can say, but make a radar in health. How, that, how, does, how does that work? We know radar from our cars, from our automotive sex. Well, radar in health is one of the upcoming technologies. Because why? It can work contactless and it's non-invasive. So what we do is we put these little radar chips on the corner of our rooms, of our hospital rooms, and we have the ability through this very small chip to do three smart things that will help our nurses. First of all, we are able to detect uh, vital signs, just as heartbeat and uh, respiration. I will show you the results. We can look at gesture recognition, and we can also look at activities. You know, is a patient walking around in the room? Is it falling down? Is he going back in bed? Is he leaving the room? Is there, is there somebody coming in the room? Is the patient alone? Is he not alone, etc.? All with a very tiny chip, which has the ability to run algorithms on the chip without no information is going backwards and forwards to the cloud. So let's go one step deeper. If you look at all the vital signs, you know, and you think back about the case that I was mentioning at the beginning, those nurses, at the moment, it takes quite a lot of time for the nurse to come along, to put the, the band on, you know, to attach the, the monitor for the heartbeat, just for checkups. So what can the radar do? Well, what you see here now is on the bottom of the screen, you see the, the reference point from the respiration belt, and on the top, you see the respiration signal we're able to select coming out of the radar signal. You see, it's pretty accurate. Without the need for attaching anything, without the need to even contacting the patient. It's a chip that's always on at all times, so there's no need for the, uh, for, the, for the nurse to come in and out every day to check up a couple of times. It's just on all the time. If there's an anomaly detection, it can be forwarded to the control room. Very similar for the heartbeat. On the bottom, you see the heartbeat coming from an ECG monitor. You can say, well, that's not the same. It doesn't have the same preci uh, precision. And that's right, but don't forget, the reason why we're using it here is just for the nurse for checking up that everything is right. She doesn't need the precision of an ECG in order to predict that everything is right. So that's one uh, case. The second one that we can use, very, very same little tiny device, very same uh, type of algorithms running on it, 
can be used for, you know, the remote controls. For those people who have been in hospitals or who have been visiting relatives in hospitals, you know how difficult it gets to get to the remote controls. You just switch on a television or to, to bring up the bed, etc. So what they do, they will just call a nurse just to get their remote control to switch on the television. A loss of time for the nurse. What can you do there? Very, very similar. With the radar signal, you're able to detect the movements, the gestures, to switch on the lights, to switch on the television, to maybe switch on another uh, device that's around it. At the moment, our radar comes with seven out-of-the-box signal uh, recognitions that can be used in order to activate one or the other device in a hospital room. Very similar is, uh, it is for activation monitoring. At the moment, we can uh, monitor 10 types of activations in the, hotel, in, in the hospital room. You can come and see us. You can also find those videos online. But I hope you realize that tiny eye is the way to go towards the future. It's one solution that will solve the problem from latency point of view, from connectivity point of view, energy usage point of view, but mainly also privacy point of view for the patient. Thank you very much. <laughs>